meeting of the committee will come to order. Pursuant to notice, I call up the bill H.R. 885, the International Nuclear Fuel for Peace and Non-Proliferation Act of 2007 for purposes of markup and move its favorable recommendation to the House. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point and the amendment in the nature of a substitute which the members have before them will be considered as read and be considered as the original text for purposes of amendment. The chair recognizes himself to explain the bill. I am very pleased that we are marking up today H.R. 885, the International Nuclear Fuel for Peace and Non-Proliferation Act of 2007. I am honored that both our Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, and former Senator Sam Nunn, who has perhaps done more to advance the cause of nuclear non-proliferation than anyone else, have embraced this bill <coughs> and that the administration is on record supporting it. I am also very pleased that our distinguished ranking member, Ileana ross Leitinen, has joined with me in supporting this effort. We will be co-sponsoring an amendment in the nature of a substitute to improve this bill. The United States Congress knows full well that Tehran is actively pursuing a destabilizing nuclear weapons program. But in many other world capitals, policymakers seem persuaded by Iran's argument that it needs access to a reliable nuclear fuel supply to meet its civilian power needs. We all know that Iran's argument is bogus, but Tehran has used the illusory threat of a breakdown in the global supply of nuclear reactor fuel to argue that it must have its own facilities to guarantee that its reactors, for the foreseeable future, all two of them, are forever supplied with fuel. The Iranian pretext has long been recognized as a gap in the global nuclear non-proliferation regime. A state could exploit the NPT's recognition of its good standing to develop peaceful uses of the atom and acquire potentially dangerous technology such as uranium enrichment. It could then turn around and use the technology to support the nuclear weapons program. The International Nuclear Fuel for Peace and Non-Proliferation Act both addresses this gap in the nuclear non-proliferation regime and removes Iran's pretexts for its own so-called peaceful enrichment plant. It does so by promoting the development of a multilateral regime of a short supply of peaceful nuclear power fuel to countries in good standing on their nuclear non-proliferation commitments. It also supports the establishment of an in independent international nuclear fuel bank that would guarantee reactor fuel to countries that forego their own enrichment plants and are in good standing with existing international nuclear safeguard commitments. This assures that states are using the fuel for energy production, not for weapons programs. H.R. 885 also authorizes $50 million to support the establishment of an IAEA-supervised international nuclear fuel bank. This money will match the $50 million offered by Warren Buffett to the Sam Non-Nuclear Threat Initiative. 
it is imperative that we keep nuclear weapons out of the hands of Iran and provide a source of nuclear fuel for peaceful ends to countries that are currently flirting with nuclear development programs. So I urge all of my colleagues to support this legislation and the bipartisan lantos ross Leitinen substitute amendment. I now yield to my friend from Florida, a ranking member of the committee, who has co-sponsored uh, the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. It is a pleasure to work with you and with your staff, and uh, I want to thank you for uh, always being gracious to, uh, uh, to the, the Republican members of the committee with the uh, changes and suggestions that we have. Uh, before I make some brief opening remarks, I'd like to recognize our uh, former uh, colleague, uh, our esteemed uh, member, former member of this uh, committee, uh, Congressman Douglas B. Ryder, who's now the president of the Asia Foundation. Doug, it's good to see you back. He always worked in a wonderfully uh, bipartisan way, and uh, we miss him uh, in these corners. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for introducing this most important uh, legislation on the establishment of an international nuclear fuel bank. Uh, it will prove to be a significant advance in the effort to prevent the further prolif proliferation of the capacity to produce nuclear weapons. I've offered a number of changes uh, to the bill, which the chairman has graciously agreed to incorporate into the amendment in the nature of a substitute of which, as he pointed out, I am a co-sponsor. These changes represent important elements of an effective non-proliferation policy that have received far too little attention. The first concerns the assumed right of countries to enrich and repossess nuclear fuel. <clears throat> Despite widespread recognition that the continued expansion of this capacity poses a growing threat to the United States national security and to that of the entire world, efforts to prevent it are undermined by the widespread belief that Article 4 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or the NPT, gives each signatory country an absolute right to enrich and repossess. <clears throat> this assertion has been made for so long and so often, including by some of the most ardent opponents of proliferation, that it has come to be looked upon by many as holy writ. But a fair reading of Article 4 clearly conditions this right on its conformity with Articles 1 and 2, as well as the overarching purpose of the entire treaty, namely preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. Given that the technology for making nuclear material for civil reactors and for bombs is essentially the same, it is, is it too great a burden and too high a risk for the world to have to disprove claims by suspect governments that this technology is being used exclusively for civilian use. The burden is too high. If we are truly committed to preventing the further expansion of enrichment and repossessing, then the U.S. policy must be to openly state that no such absolute right exists. And we must work to ensure that this approach is adopted by our allies and all who are opposed to further proliferation. And this bill that the chairman has does precisely that. A second set of changes prevents state sponsors of terrorism from hosting a nuclear fuel bank or receiving anything from it. As such, the bill seeks to ensure that U.S. policy does not contribute to Iran's nuclear efforts, whether civilian or military. I'm grateful that we've been able to agree on language that incorporates this essential provision into the bill while preserving the overarching and important objectives of the chairman's nuclear fuel bank proposal. A further requirement for both, both host and recipient states is that they have in place effective and enforceable export controls regarding nuclear and dual-use technology and other sensitive materials comparable to those of the United States. An additional restriction is that countries seeking assistance from a fuel bank may not possess enrichment or reprocessing facilities. Guaranteeing a supply of fuel to states while allowing them to start and stop at will their operation of suspect facilities would do little to halt the spread of this technology and perhaps even encourage it. So a final set of changes would ensure that fuel to be made available by the bank will be unsubsidized and offered at current market prices. 
Although well-intentioned, the temptation to persuade countries to forego establishing their own enrichment and repossessing capabilities by subsidizing nuclear fuel would have many negative consequences. These would range from imposing an open-ended financial burden on the United States and other countries to encouraging an expansion of nuclear power beyond that which is economically rational. An international nuclear fuel bank is a complex issue requiring in-depth investigation and discussion. Adoption of this bill as amended by the substitute before us will help drive further discussions on a nuclear fuel bank. I thank the chairman, chairman for the changes. I thank him for offering this amendment and this bill before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. A number of colleagues, I think, may want to say a few words. I have been asked to recognize Mr. Royce. I, th I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, though it's a concept that's been around for, for some time, I think an international fuel bank is a bold proposal. And I think given the proliferation challenges we face, bold is what we need. And um, I think fuel bank proposals, though, face some challenges. We heard a little bit about some of those challenges during the hearings uh, that we held last week. Overall, though, the concept is worth pursuing, and I, I certainly commend you, Mr. Chairman, for pursuing it. I, I want to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for incorporating two amendments that I put forth. One addresses the concern that a fuel bank could subsidize nuclear fuel and, and nuclear energy worldwide, and with that, of course, would be attendant security risks. So when you subsidize something, you get more of it. Uh, the other addresses the concern that a fuel bank would pose in and of itself a proliferation risk if it became an enrichment and reprocessing center that had the, the impact of disseminating this technology. And when you think about it, AQ Khan stole technology from a multinational enrichment center. So guarding against such opportunists, um, given what he was able to do with his, with his uh, black market and nuclear proliferation, is going to be essential. This bill challenges the alleged right of nations under the NPT to enrich and reprocess nuclear fuel, though not in as forceful terms as I'd wish. I know the bill's authors reject this right, and as this process evolves, I'm hopeful we can work together to undermine the notion that a country can develop technology to bring it to the cusp of being a nuclear weapon state, yet remain good standing as a member uh, under the NPT. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for your efforts here. Thank you very much. Mr. Ackerman. No statement, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Smith. <coughs> Any other colleague who would like to be heard? If not, uh, are there any amendments? If not, the question occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. All in favor will vote aye. 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 All opposed will vote no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Further proceedings on this measure is postponed until the chair notes the presence of a reporting quorum. <laughs> Pursuant to notice, I call up the bill H.R. 2446, the Afghanistan Freedom and Security Support Act of 2007, for purposes of markup and move its favorable recommendation to the House. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I yield myself five minutes to explain this legislation. H.R. 2446 continues our bipartisan efforts to provide a serious and long-term commitment to the freedom, security, and stability of Afghanistan. I'm very pleased to have worked so closely with my good friend and colleague, the ranking member of this committee, Ms. Ross Leighton, and 
on this important legislation. Afghanistan is once again on the brink. Nearly five years since the 9-11 attacks and the subsequent ouster of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan, the, con the country runs a real risk of falling into the hands of the Taliban yet again. We cannot and we will not allow this to happen. We have come too far in our efforts in Afghanistan <coughs> simply to stop cold now. This is not the first time Afghanistan has faced a turning point. Its people have been beset by turmoil and strife for many decades. This time, we aim to get it right. As we speak, the volatile southern part of Afghanistan is aflame with dangerous clashes between coalition-led forces and insurgents. The rebel Taliban has reorganized and is threatening the very stability of the country. But there are several problems that underscore the violence. The opium trade in Afghanistan is as strong as ever. Corruption, especially related to the drug trade, is rampant in the country. Basic infrastructure, health, energy, roads, and the rule of law is still sorely lacking. When the speaker and I and some colleagues visited there recently, all of these issues were far too obvious for all of us. The United States has pledged its commitment to Afghanistan's long-term stability and security. This bill is essential, urgent, and most importantly represents a fulfillment of that promise. The first title of our bill provides much needed assistance for health care, energy development, women and girls, assistance to combat corruption, and assistance for a crop substitution program to curtail poppy production. Under this section, the administration and all future ones will be required to certify whether any senior official in Afghanistan's provincial and local government is involved in the illegal narcotics trade. Aid will be limited to such governments accordingly. The bill also requires the president to appoint a coordinator for our assistance policies, including counter-narcotics and it mandates accountability in the effort to eliminate corruption related to narcotics. Title II strongly bolsters security and policing in Afghanistan, authorizing the International Security Force beyond October 2007, and provides for further training of the Afghan military and police. It encourages greater participation from countries in the region, and it mandates the creation of a special drug interdiction team. I think we all now recognize that security in Afghanistan is intertwined with the fight against the narcotics trade. Title III ensures greater planning and accountability for the future of the country and fosters regional coordination. A structured blueprint for 2008 will be required. Reporting and evaluation measures will be expanded and extended. These are all crucial provisions for meeting benchmarks and assessing progress in Afghanistan. I want to repeat, we will not let Afghanistan fail. The world is watching us to see whether we have the resolve to fight the terrorist forces threatening Afghanistan to help maintain that country's security and stability. I urge all of my colleagues to join me in strongly supporting this legislation. And now it's my pleasure to yield to my friend, the ranking member, the lead Republican co-sponsor of this legislation, Ms. Ross Leitner. Thank you, as always, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to voice my strong support for your bill H.R. 2446, the Afghanistan Freedom Support Act reauthorization. This bill is a product of a bipartisan cooperation on an issue of critical importance to our efforts to fight the scourge of Islamist uh, terror worldwide. 
Since the year 2001, the people of Afghanistan, with the support of the international community, have developed one of the most moderate constitutions in the Islamic world, participated in their first presidential election, selected a cabinet, and conducted peace, a peaceful inauguration, elected a parliament, and have continued to fight off the Taliban and al-Qaeda elements. It is vital that we continue to provide critical reconstruction and security assistance to this fledgling democracy, a priority that we pursued in a bipartisan manner in this bill. One of the critical items in this legislation that we reached agreement on is a prohibition on assistance to Afghan local and provincial governments, officials who, based on credible evidence, are found to be supporting Islamic terrorist activities, narcotics traffickers and producers, and other criminal activities. This important oversight provision will be instrumental in assuring that vital U.S. reconstruction assistance is properly allocated and utilized. I'm particularly pleased that together we have worked to establish the means for developing a long overdue and coherent interdepartmental counter-narcotics strategy that addresses the deadly and neglected illicit drug trade and its links to radical Islamic terrorism that imperil Afghanistan's future. In February, I wrote to the administration on the need for a cross-the-board change in our policy on the illicit drug threat fueling the resurgence of the Taliban, attacks on our coalition troops, and official corruption in Afghanistan. The bill before us incorporates many of the recommendations I proposed in this letter. The bill will prompt much-needed changes by mandati mandating the appointment of a high-level interdepartmental Afghan coordinator with emphasis on development of a coherent government-wide counter-drug policy. This includes bringing the U.S. military into the fight, providing meaningful support of the Drug Enforcement Administration with an emphasis on interdiction and the extradition of major drug kingpins. I am pleased that we were able to come up to an, with an agreement on the extension of the drawdown authority for military equipment, which promotes greater cooperation with the International Security Assistance Force and other allies in Afghanistan. The bill ensures that we will be pre-training, that we will be pre-training vetting of recruits of the Afghan police to help adequately assess the candidate's aptitude, professional skills, integrity, and other qualifications for law enforcement work before they enter the service. And finally, the bill ensures that strong U.S. allies as the Colombian Anti-Narcotics Police Unit have, who have trained their Afghan counterparts both in Kabul and in Bogota are able to encourage to participate in Afghan counter-narcotics operations where their skills and their years of experience can help us all with the scourge of narco-terrorism. I witnessed firsthand this Colombian-Afghan counter-narcotics cooperation and training earlier this month when I traveled with uh, Congressman Hastert to the Hungla School in Espinal, Colombia. It is critical that we not only work together in this body to develop policies that address critical issues in Afghanistan, but we also must promote better coordination among our allies in our fight against jihadists in Afghanistan throughout the region and beyond. Again, I thank Chairman Lantos for his cooperation on this measure, and I urge my colleagues to support this critical legislation. Thank you very much. I will call on Mr. Royce to make whatever comments he would like. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, I really want to thank you for inclu including the uh, reauthorization of Radio Free Afghanistan in this bill. I worked on that legislation for five years prior to the death of uh, Commander Massoud and, and uh, the attack on 9-11. After that, we were able to get the bill through and we began, process, we began the, the, the process of having these broadcasts in Dari and Pashto to the, to the people of Afghanistan. Today, 60 percent of the adult population listens to those broadcasts every day. And I think that the fact that they focus on democracy and programs on health and programs on education, uh, as, as bad as things are in Afghanistan today, I think they'd be a whole lot worse if we didn't have that conduit for the free flow of information. They're usually first with the news on the ground, 
Uh, and uh, there are 35 uh, reporters. I've met with the reporters in Kabul and, and some of the stringers from around the country uh, when I was over there. They really have a commitment to freedom of information. And because people now can hear something besides Radio Sharia, uh, I think we've got a hope for changing the attitudes of uh, people in the countryside. So I thank you very much for the reauthorization of this act and including it in, in this bill. Let me commend my friend from California for his leadership on free radio for Afghanistan. Any other colleague would like to make an opening statement? If, if, are there any amendments? If not, uh, uh, further proceedings on this measure are postponed until the chair notes the presence of a reporting quorum. We have a series of non-controversial bills on the agenda. It is the intention of the chair to consider these measures on block and by unanimous consent authorize the chair to seek consideration of the remaining bills on the suspension of the rules. All members are given leave to insert remarks on the measures into the record should they choose to do so. Are there any members who wish to be heard on any of the measures I am presenting on block? If not, without objection, the chairman is authorized to seek consideration of the following bills on their suspension of the rules and the amendments to those measures which the members have before them shall be deemed adopted. The list is as follows. S-676, to provide for certain persons, may serve on the board of directors of the Inter-American Foundation. H. Conrad 21, calling on the United Nations Security Council to charge Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad with violating the 1948 Genocide Convention. H. Conrad 80, calling on the government of Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army to recommit to a political solution to the conflict in northern Uganda, urging immediate and substantial U.S. support for the ongoing peace process and for other purposes. H. Conrad 151, noting the disturbing pattern of killings of dozens of independent journalists in Russia over the last decade. H. Conrad 152, relating to the 40th anniversary of the Six-Day War and the reunification of the city of Jerusalem. H. 137, honoring the life and six decades of public service of Jacob Birnbaum and especially his commitment to freeing Soviet Jews from religious, cultural, and communal extinction. H. 226, to recognize John Paler for his contribution to the nation in helping to rescue Jews and other minorities from the Holocaust during World War II. H.R.S. 233, recognizing over 200 years of sovereignty of the Principality of Liechtenstein and for other purposes. H.R.S. 295, recognizing the strong alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States. HRS 295, supporting the ideals and values of the Olympic movement. HRS 397, condemning violence in Estonia, expressing solidarity with the democratic government and the people of Estonia. HRS 412, expressing gratitude to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and His Royal Highness Prince Philip Duke of Edinburgh for their state visit to the United States and reaffirming the friendship that exists between the United States and the United Kingdom. HRS 418, recognizing and welcoming the delegation of presidents, prime ministers from the Caribbean to Washington, D.C. HRS 422, calling on the government of the People's Republic of China to use its unique influence and economic leverage 
to assist in stopping genocide and violence in Darfur, Sudan. And finally, HRS 430, calling for the government of Iran to immediately release three dual American Iranian citizens currently being held unjustly and illegally. Pursuant to notice, I call up the bill HR 2420, the International Climate Cooperation Reengagement Act of 2007. Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry on that. If the gentleman will hold a moment. Of course. Pursuant to notice, I call up the bill HR 2420, the International Climate Cooperation Reengagement Act of 2007 for purposes of markup and move its favorable recommendation to the House. I'm now pleased to recognize my friend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, I understand that there will be some Democratic amendments adopted to the bill first, and then I'll be able to offer my amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, I believe it's Mr. Green will be offering those amendments. Uh, can the chairman assure me that it will be in order for me to offer my amendment after the Democratic amendments have been considered and that no point of order will be raised against my amendment based upon the fact that these first amendments were considered and adopted? I am pleased to reassure my friend that his understanding is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure. Then I'd like my amendments to be considered. I'm, I'm sorry. Without objection, the the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Chairman, I have amendment to I the desk. If, if you'll hold for a Chair. minute. Chair yields himself five minutes to explain the legislation. I'm very delighted today to move forward with H.R. 2420 the International Climate Cooperation Reengagement Act of 2007. At the outset, let me thank my good friend and colleague from New Jersey, Congressman Chris Smith, for his help in crafting this important bipartisan measure to combat global warming, which has a total of 26 committee members as co-sponsors of the bill. The legislation before us today is the product of an extensive committee investigation into the American government's response to climate change, including two full committee hearings on the subject of energy independence and global warming. With passage of the Lantos-Smith bill, the Foreign Affairs Committee will have responded strongly to Speaker Pelosi's call for all committees of jurisdiction to produce legislation to begin the long process of tackling global warming and encouraging energy independence. I anticipate that our bill will be considered on the floor of the House in July, along with climate change measures produced by other committees of jurisdiction. The Lantos-Smith bill signals a turning point in United States engagement with the international community on global warming. No longer will we debate and delay endlessly concerning this crisis. We will finally act to curtail global warming in a far-reaching and significant way. Title I of our bill sets out a blueprint for high-level global diplomatic engagement. This means sending senior-level officials to negotiate a binding deal rather than sending low-level bureaucrats to meetings to figure out how best to stall and delay and fail to act. This section also sets out negotiating instructions based on real science and the lessons from carbon emission policies elsewhere. A viable target for stabilizing carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere of the Earth. Binding emissions reduction targets. 
technology sharing agreements and flexible mechanisms such as cap and trade to make the agreement economically palatable. And unlike the Kyoto Agreement, we call for binding emissions commitments from both China and India. Title II of our measure sets out specific steps that we will take to help nations develop and adopt clean and renewable energy production. This includes funding for crucial technology sharing and energy assistance programs. Again, it leverages existing institutions and agencies, USAID, the Commerce Department, and the underused Clean Energy Technology Experts Initiative, which bring together many agencies. Let me stress that our legislation is not a budget-busting bill. The funding provided in this title represents a modest 20% increase over traditional funding levels for these types of activities, which given the potentially catastrophic impact of global warming on human civilization is a very modest increase indeed. Title II of our legislation engages China and India specifically. As some of the largest polluters and most robustly growing economies, we simply cannot stem global warming without serious collaboration with China and India. Title III establishes an international clean energy foundation. I'm very excited about this idea. The foundation will act as an international clearinghouse for an exchange of innovative ideas to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Every relevant aspect of societies around the world will participate. NGOs, private companies, climate and energy scientists, and foreign governments. We have crafted a slim, efficient entity to carry out the work of the foundation and limited its funding to $20 million per year. The Lanta-Smith bill is a bipartisan measure to reinvigorate the long-lacking American leadership on global warming. I urge all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join Mr. Smith and me in supporting this very important legislation. I'm now pleased to yield to my friend from Florida, the ranking member, to express her views on this legislation. Thank you so much, as always, uh, Mr. Chairman. When my good friend, the chairman, announced yesterday that he had introduced his bill on climate change, he said that the United States should be a leader on this issue. And I agree with him that the United States can be a leader on a number of global environmental challenges, including the issue of uh, climate change. And I think the United States already is a leader on a number of environmental fronts. The extensive efforts undertaken by the United States government in recent years to promote environmentally friendly technologies and practices are clearly outlined in the climate change report submitted to Congress mm -hmm. under the requirements of the Energy Policy Act of 2005. The report covered a broad range of activities undertaken by the Department of State, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USTR, EPA, and the Departments of Energy and Commerce. We can always do more. And if the bill before us had offered innovative new ideas and approaches to address the range of global environmental challenges, I would have been happy to support it. However, that was not to be. The bill sets up a new office structure at the State Department to focus on climate change, but ignores the fact that we already have an office in the Department's Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Sciences that deals with these issues. The bill is silent on how many, of, how many new personnel will be needed in this new office and at what cost. The legislation also seems to ignore the current efforts and existence of the senior climate negotiator and special representative by creating a new duplicative position. The bill authorizes $1 billion over five years in new funds 
for AID, but it's not clear how this figure was calculated. We have received an estimate from the majority of anywhere from 100 to $180 million a year that USAID currently spends on environmental programs in developing countries. The $200 million yearly authorized by this bill would apparently be in addition to that, given that the findings in Title II of the bill have several references to programs suffering from low levels of federal funding, end quote. Furthermore, the bill sets up a new foundation authorizing more funds for that new organization, but does not explain what the new foundation would do that is new and different from existing programs and efforts. We recently had a debate in the House on the intelligence authorization, which contained a provision mandating that the intelligence community use its resources to develop a national intelligence estimate on the issue of global warming. There were concerns about using intelligence funds for that purpose, but the provision was adopted by the House. In that context, we anticipated that the majority would wait to receive an assessment of the nature and the extent of the problem, as well as the range of factors contributing to it and recommendations on how to best address those issues. However, here we are marking up legislation that arranges for new funds that sets up additional offices and new foundation without further review beyond the one committee hearing held last week on this matter. Regrettably, we did not even have any input from official witnesses during that hearing. We did have a good panel of three private witnesses and their testimony and comments were informative, but I would be surprised if any of our members walked away from that one hearing thinking that the path to addressing climate change is a clear one. We all share the desire to do more to exert U.S. leadership in the environmental realm, and that's why we proposed a number of amendments to the majority for their consideration. These amendments sought to extend the bill's focus beyond just global climate change and sought to better target existing resources, operations, and programs on addressing the range of global environmental challenges. Then, if needed, we would develop new legislative strategies based on a more careful assessment of these challenges. Unlike the Nuclear Fuel Bank Bill and the Afghanistan Freedom Support Act Reauthorization Bill, we were unable to come to a mutually acceptable agreement. Our proposals are now incorporated in an amendment in the nature of a substitute to be offered by Mr. Manzullo, the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and the Global Environment. I ask my colleagues on the committee to render their full support to the Manzullo substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my friend and I want to yield to the lead Republican co-sponsor of this legislation, Mr. Smith of New Jersey. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank you for introducing this important legislation. I'm very proud to be a co-sponsor of it. In this important and timely piece of legislation, Mr. Chairman, Congress will be recognizing that the continued buildup of greenhouse gases threatens the stability as well as the sustainability of the global climate and that climate change is a global challenge that must be addressed and done so vigorously. It requires a coordinated response by the international community that reduces global emissions to a stabilized level, and this bill lays out the framework by which the U.S. can take a leading role in accomplishing that goal. The bill's statement of policy emphasizes the necessity for all, and I repeat all, major greenhouse emitting countries to more fully cooperate in reducing and stabilizing atmospheric concentrations of these gases. As I think every member knows, rapidly industrializing countries, especially China and India, uh, are a major pollution contributor. They need to be the focus of a concentrated diplomatic strategy to obtain a consensus toward achieving, achieving this goal. I would remind my colleagues that Kyoto, although it had some very good intentions, uh, left out China and India uh, from the enforcement mechanism, an egregious flaw that needs to be remedied and hopefully this legislation starts paving the way for a new instrument to succeed the Kyoto Protocol when the first commitment period expires in 2012. We want China and India to be part of the mechanism. In the time that you and I have served in Congress, Mr. Chairman, we have witnessed how the designation of an office within the State Department to focus attention and energy on critical issues can achieve notable results 
within a very short period of time. This has been the case, for example, with the Office to Monitor and Combat Human Trafficking. As you know, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act created that position, and we also created the ambassador at large. In like manner, we did so with the International Religious Freedom Act, which was opposed by the previous administration. They didn't want a new office. They were very much against it. That office, led by Ambassador John Hanford, has done yeoman's work in trying to mitigate the issue of religious persecution around the world. It was the focus of the trafficking and the religious freedom offices that have made a profound difference, not only within the State Department, but around the world. The idea of an office and an ambassador at large is an idea that has proven itself time and time again. The replication of that concept in this legislation, I think, will move the ball forward on the climate change issue. I would also point out to my colleagues that the idea isn't all that new. I introduced a bill in 1990, H.R. 4695, on May 1st of 1990, to create such an office 17 years ago. Had that office been up and running, I think we would have had, I think, much more success in coordinating a policy around the world as well as within our own country. So I say to my colleagues who say it's duplicative, we heard that argument before. We heard it on trafficking, we heard it on religious freedom, and in each instance it has proven itself to be extremely valuable as an as a office to walk point on a particular issue. Mr. Chairman, we know that climate change has had a disproportionate impact on the vulnerable poor populations of the world. Therefore, I am pleased that this legislation includes authorization of funding for developing countries to promote clean and efficient energy technologies. This is an important aspect of creating local sustainable capacity and will complement well the other programs goals of our foreign assistance. The creation of a International Clean Energy, energy Foundation promises to add a particularly effective tool in our arsenal against adverse climate change. The foundation will promote programs that serve as models for significantly reducing global greenhouse gas emissions through clean and efficient energy technologies, processes, and services. Partnerships with foreign governments, especially with member organizations of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, as well as the private sector, will be sought in order to leverage resources. The foundation will also be charged with harnessing global knowledge from experts around the world and with creating a repository of information on best practices for the utilization of clean and efficient energy technologies. Just a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Chairman, a group of businesses and leading environmental organizations, including Shell, the Dow Chemical Company, Johnson & Johnson, which has its world headquarters just north of my district uh, in New Brunswick, and Duke Energy, issued a formal statement calling on the federal government to, quote, take immediate action to enact mandatory national legislation to achieve significant reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. This legislation responds to their call and the call of many and the expectations of the American people that we address this serious issue with significant and decisive action. I thank the chair and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And let me reassure all of my colleagues that everybody will have an opportunity to express his or her views on this most important piece of legislation. I now turn to Mr. Green for his amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I actually have four amendments I'd like to be able to be considered in block. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, the, the first amendment, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have him considered read. All, uh, Without objection. May I proceed? Mr. Chairman, the and members, the First Amendment clarify that the policy of the United States on any international agreement negotiated on climate change would take into consideration the impact that it would have on American industry and American competitiveness. Uh, I have a very industrial district that uh, um, we believe we can compete, and it provides both good paying jobs and our manufacturing base. Uh, I would hope that uh, our agency we're creating here would make sure that they. Uh, uh, they place as a priority making sure that our competitive disadvantage, uh, that we don't have a competitive disadvantage with other foreign industries when we deal with climate change uh, issues. And the second and third amendments 
would require the USAID and the International Clean Energy Foundation, respectively, to promote the use of American-made clean energy, efficient energy technologies whenever possible when implementing sections 202, 203 of the bill. And finally, the last amendment would amend section 203 of the underlying bill and give the uh, Commerce Secretary discretion to expand the U.S. clean energy exports and outreach to other countries beyond just China and India. And I know yesterday we talked and I uh, understand they're acceptable. Um, the chair wishes to state that all amendments offered by Mr. Green are accepted by the chair and the chair strongly supports them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we now turn to Mr. Mansulo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have, the I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. Could somebody give the amendment to the clerk, please? Clerk will read. Can we get a copy to the clerk? Clerk will read the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Manzullo. I would ask unanimous consent to, to dispense with the reading of the amendment. Without objection. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very uh, sympathetic uh, towards the goal uh, that you're trying to achieve and, and agree with it. Uh, despite anybody's opinion as to whether or not global warming is occurring, we should all unite behind an effort to combat all forms of pollution and promote the sale of U.S. environmental export. However, I believe this bill uh, is flawed uh, for, th for three main reasons. First, uh, the practical effect of H.R. 2420 only proposes to combat air pollution, even though numerous reports and studies show that conflict over access to clean water and contaminated food is more of an immediate threat to our national and economic security than climate change. The UN Development Program's Human Development Report of 2006 states that there is a growing crisis with respect to clean water, and if it is not addressed as a priority issue, it will inherently lead to greater insecurity around the world. Just because advocates for clean water don't have a famous person to make a movie for them uh, shouldn't detract from the mission that we should unite together to combat all forms of pollution, and not just those involved in the air. Second, the underlying bill increases government spending and adds to the size and scope of the federal government. H.R. 2420 creates one new duplicative office at the State Department that has already been performed in some capacity by five other offices at State. The underlying bill proposes to create an International Clean Energy Foundation that duplicates the work already performed by the UN Fund for International Partnerships. The bill proposes to authorize spending $100 million over five years on establishing this foundation to make grants to projects outside the U.S that model how to reduce greenhouse glass gases. H.R. 2420 also proposes to create five new programs or initiatives, such as a new international exchange program at a cost of over $1 billion. I simply don't know how we're going to pay for this. And as the chairman will recall, it wasn't but a couple of weeks ago uh, that we passed out a committee, another bill on increasing international exchange programs named in honor of the late Senator Paul Simon. This is still another international exchange program. Third, I have very serious problems with the process of handling this legislation. As the ranking Republican of the subcommittee that deals with global environmental issues, we never had a chance to closely examine this legislation. No hearings were held at the subcommittee level. In fact, the subcommittee plans to hold a hearing on climate change next month after the bill is marked up. The one hearing held at the full committee level last week involved no participation by the administration, which has serious concerns about the legislation. The, the bill seems to be driven more by an artificial deadline imposed by the Democratic leadership than by an effort to develop good public policy. Earlier this month, the House voted to require a national intelligence estimate 
on global climate change. And yet before we even get the intelligence authorization bill out of Congress committee, we we're, moving to build to, we're moving to build to create more bureaucracy to bolster our government's effort to respond to climate change. We could have worked together to develop a good bipartisan package. For example, H.R. 2420 only included China and India, but not Brazil, a similarly large developing country, as a priority for the export of U.S. environmental technologies. This mistake could have easily been rectified if the minority had been adequately consulted. H.R. 2420 contains a statement of congressional policy that the U.S. shall negotiate new binding mitigation commitments from all major emitting countries based on their level of development under the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change. Didn't the Senate vote 95 to 0 a few years ago against such a commitment because economic dynamos like China, India, Brazil were left out? Our manufacturing sector, and I have heavy manufacturing, such as Mr. Green's district, can't take any more hits to our global competitiveness if the U.S. imposes new regulations on their sector while giving a pass to the major competitors in the developing world. Finally, the minority never received the final version of this legislation until 1.38 p.m. yesterday, less than 24 hours before the markup. That makes it very difficult to have meaningful input. However, Mr. Chairman, my amendment rectifies all these problems. It brings us back to what unites us all. We should be doing all in our power to combat global pollution. Instead of creating yet another bureaucratic office, my amendment streamlines the five offices at state that deal in some way with climate change and elevates to ambassadorship the importance of the environmental directorate at state to confront all problems of global pollution, including climate change. In this tight budgetary climate, it sees over $1 billion in potential spending over the next five years by eliminating all the authorization levels and requires the funding to come out of existing sources. Last, it makes relevant export promotion agencies focus like a laser beam on promoting U.S. environmental exports, particularly to the emerging economies of China, India, and Brazil. In effect, Mr. Chairman, the substitute not only encompasses all the goals of the underlying bill, but it adds critical areas of water, food contamination, biodiversity, et cetera. And at the same time, it costs the taxpayers nothing more, saving over a billion dollars on the underlying bill. Mr. Chairman, I respectfully ask for your support and the support of my colleagues for my amendment because it takes, it takes a, a good underlying bill, perfects it, and makes it a lot better. Thank you very much. I want to thank my friend from Illinois for offering this amendment. It is the intention of the chair to recognize colleagues alternating between the two sides. And um, at last, I will make some comments on the Manzullo Amendment. Uh, Mr. Ackerman. Ms. Ms. Ross Leitner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had made my uh, position clear in my opening statement. I hope that uh, all of our members support the Manzullo Amendment, which uh, gets at the heart of the problem and doesn't duplicate an already existing uh, system. Thank you. Mr. Falamovega. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to ask Mr. Green a question, if I could, uh, with regards to his amendment. When he says that we will promote the use of American-made clean and efficient energy technologies, is he include, including nuclear in that? Mr. Green here. We'll have him respond oh, I, I, when I, I, he returns. Let me just say briefly, with the deepest respect to Mr. Manzullo, uh, my good friend and colleague, I reluctantly uh, rise in opposition to his substitute. I again want to reiterate how important I believe it is uh, that this new office with an ambassador at large be created. Uh, the naysayers on, on specialty offices within the Department of State uh, have been shown to be wrong time and time again. Uh, when we did it, and Mr. Chairman, you will recall when we fought the fight on the International Religious Freedom Act, the previous administration vigorously opposed us uh, in establishing that office, as well as the ambassador at large. Uh, but one year later, when the ambassador at large came and testified before my subcommittee on, on, on uh, global human rights and international operations, admitted uh, that none of the parade of horribles that they had anticipated indeed happened. Indeed, 
it was a significant step forward in working with governments around the world to promote religious freedom. In like manner, the, the, in the uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act took two years to enact. It was riddled with, or not riddled, it was filled with, with, with people who opposed it, uh, most of them off the record who felt that the office uh, would not uh, do much. We already had existing capacity. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, by having a consolidated effort uh, that focused perhaps almost like a laser beam on the issue of human trafficking, uh, we were able to achieve and continue to achieve notable results uh, on that very important human rights issue. I believe w when you're talking about global warming, uh, as I said before, Mr. Chairman, I've been working on this uh, since the late 1980s uh, and believe that the science really does s s portray a scenario uh, that, that is very ominous for, for human life, vegetarian, uh, veg uh, all life, uh, throughout the, all of the uh, ecosystems in this country, in the country in the world. And even if the, if the alarmists, uh, and there are people who engage in hyperbole on this, even if they're just partly wrong, we have a significant issue that has to be addressed. These offices within the State Department work, they work well, and I think uh, the United States should walk point on trying to ensure that we have a clean and safe environment to the greatest extent possible. And finally, the inclusion of China and India, uh, which was left out, and I underscore that with exclamation points, was left out of the Kyoto Protocol, a grave omission. Um, uh, that is something that this legislation seeks to, to include them uh, so that you know, we all breathe the same air, as we saw after the Chernobyl uh, accident and meltdown, what, what the, 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 the um, fallout went around the world five, six times before it finally dissipated. Uh, nearby countries, especially, you, especially Belarus, were disproportionately adversely affected. We all breathe the same air. There are no boundaries when it comes to air. And it seems to me uh, that, that the U.S. should be the, the preeminent leader when it comes to global warming. This office will ensure that we do it by the book and that it's all predicated on good science. And I think that's another important aspect of this legislation. I yield back, and I, again, reluctantly rise in opposition would the chairman, to this would, amendment. Would the, uh, excuse me, would the gentleman yield? Uh, we will, uh, the lady will be recognized on her own time. Mr. Falama Vega. Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's so much controversy over the issue of global warming and climate change uh, that I doubt it if anyone uh, on this panel really has had an in-depth briefing or understanding of, of, uh, of the arguments. Uh, the one thing that I'm concerned about is creating more bureaucracy in the government of the United States when we already have too much. Uh, we have, according to the information that I have before me, we have uh, at least five offices at the State Department that have jurisdiction over climate change. Uh, I would have no problem in consolidating all of those offices into one and putting somebody in charge of researching climate change and trying to find an answer. But to come up with over a billion dollars in new spending and also creating a new bureaucracy just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so um, I think we need to have more scientific research, uh, uh, but uh, to jump into this right now, especially with having only one hearing and not having anybody from the administration before us, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't really make sense. All of us have been to places that have a lot of pollution. India, India uh, an ally of ours, you can't even go outside the hotel because it's so, so dirty. In, in, in Egypt, you can almost chew the air in Cairo. Uh, in, in China, you have problems like that. In Brazil, those countries need to be intimately involved in this issue. And I don't think the United States, which has been leading in the area of trying to uh, stop uh, putting pollutants into the atmosphere, uh, should be the uh, really the uh, country that's uh, carrying the ball on this time after time after time. Uh, so I, I support the Manzullo substitute, and I hope that we will put off creating a new bureaucracy right now until we have more information and more scientific research that leads us in one direction or the other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, rise in strong support of uh, H.R. 2420. I, uh, if, if anyone's just uh, finding out that there's a problem and that we need to have more study, we probably need to study them. Uh, you know, there's been some problems in the world with global warming. And the more we sit around and talk about let's do a study, you know, at some point there'll be no need for any more study because the damage will be irreparable. We're almost reading, uh, reaching that, that point now. We've had cities that have done more than we've done as a, a, a national body trying to lead our nation in the right direction. We've had counties to do more. We've had states, even the state of California, have got all kinds of uh, programs going in because evidently people are saying that the federal government uh, is sitting around while um, the globe is burning. And so I can't see where another study so we can really verify whether we're having a problem. There's a problem. I think that we need to have some organization that looks at it. I think that this legislation seems to be a vehicle to do that. I, I you know, as I indicated, that, uh, you Would know, the our government. Would yield? Sure, I'd be glad to yield. Uh, my substitute does not call for a study. This is essentially the same program as the underlying bill, only it's finessed and expanded. All right, well, uh, reclaiming my time, I was just talking about your major sponsor, Mr. Burton, who said he wants a little more study. Will you the wanna, gentleman well, yield? Sure, I'll yield, Ms. Burton. I did not ask for a study. I just said we need more scientific research before we jump to a conclusion. Uh, you know, there are a large number of scientists that don't agree with what we're talking about today. And I think that we need to hear from them as well as those who uh, have been very uh, uh, strong in their advocacy of doing just what we're talking about with this bill today. So, you know, uh, I, I don't know that we need to study, but I think we need more information. And I don't think anybody on this panel is an expert. Right. Reclaiming my time, I, what do you call it, a study or more scientific information or, or whatever you, nomenclature you want to give it, it's to go out and try to uh, gather more. I think we need to have action now. I think that action is too far, and Mr. Manzullo has a way that he wants to go about it, and I, I think that things he says makes a lot of sense. However, I do believe that this bill, in the form that it is today, would move us to where we need to, do, to go. Next week, I'm going to have a hearing on on global warming as it impacts on Africa since I chair the Africa subcommittee. And believe it or not, the people who are the poorest in the world, the people who have more people living on less than a dollar a day, that continent is going to be the one that's really going to suffer the most. So people who are suffering the most are going to even have more impact. So I certainly support this legislation. I yield back. Mr. Tancredo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It just seems to me that in reviewing this information as uh, quickly as I can and, uh, and listening to the discussion, that what we're really talking about here is uh, something in the form of the Manzullo Amendment that accomplishes the same goals as the original bill, but does so with structural changes that, that then um, eliminate the need for the duplication that I think may exist in the original bill and also the costs. Uh, and I guess I'm saying, am, am I wrong there, Mr. Manzullo? Isn't that what we are trying to accomplish? It, it simply looks like this, the goals are the same, the, the methods of getting there are a little bit different and somewhat more streamlined. Uh, and I think that that is, uh, of course, a, a positive uh, addition to the bill. The gentleman and I'll know, yield. The, uh, the gentleman from Colorado is correct. What this bill does, it it takes the emphasis off the argument as to whether or not global warming exists and instead places the emphasis on global pollution as to which there is unanimity. Um, the, the second thing it does, um, it takes the best of the underlying bill and adds to it. Let me give you an example. And I don't know how to say this without, well, I, all right. I have 303,000 beef cattle in my district. Uh, not including dairy cattle. 
this bill only addresses the methane and not the manure. Uh, because the methane is what goes into the air. Uh, there's this big issue going on. What do you do when cows do what they do? Um, the manure issue, Mr. Chairman, deals with, with water pollution and runoff. What this bill will do is it expands the scope of the underlying bill to include all forms of pollution. Uh, and it includes the green amendment, green amendments, and it eliminates the bureaucracies. So this really is the best of all worlds because this puts everybody on, on the page of fighting global pollution and not spending lots of time well, worrying about whether or not global warming uh, actually exists. You know, I would yield back to my colleague who yielded to me. I yield the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for authoring the bill and bringing it for markup. There's no question that our planet is warming. This indeed is an established fact acknowledged by serious scientists of every stripe. But you do not need to be a scientist to see the evidence. In my own hometown in Los Angeles, the summers are longer and they're hotter. And just a few weeks ago, we had a fire right in Griffith Park that uh, caused a number of my constituents and um, one of my DC staff's relatives to flee their homes. We're having more and more of these fires and they're happening earlier and earlier in the season because of the lack of rainfall and snowfall brought on by global warming. Uh, this year has been the driest in the history of the city. And we see these trends, not just in my backyard, but around the world. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I served as the ambassador to Micronesia a few years back. And they are facing the very real possibility of the sea level rising and threatening much of their territory. Many of the 607 islands are right at sea level. The crisis in Darfur, Mr. Chairman, is caused by the actions of the Sudanese regime, but the roots of the crisis lie in the climate changes that are drying up huge stretches of farmland in Africa. And uh, many of the tribes, the nomadic tribes, are going to where they can uh, raise uh, their goats and other uh, life and where they can make a living. So members of this committee would like to see themselves as great defenders of Israel. But Israel faces a real threat to its existence if Iran gets nuclear weapons. And this committee has been united in opposing the Iranian nuclear program and supporting Israel as they face the threat of their survival. But I find it simply amazing that we're not talking at all about the threat that global warming poses to Israel's survival. There has not been any sizable snowpack in the mountains in the north of Israel for several years now. And that snow is the source of Israel's water. So I think it would be a grand irony, Mr. Chairman, if the United States were successful in protecting Israel from the threat of nuclear destruction only to turn a blind eye as Israel succumbs to a slow burn from global warming. So Mr. Chairman, is, it is beyond time for talk on global warming and action is long overdue. We cannot turn a blind eye to one of the greatest national security challenges this country has ever faced. So I urge my colleagues to support this bill, reject the uh, amendments, uh, Mr. Mansoulos amendments, and uh, let's get to work on what we need to do, and that's to confront in a scientific and a realistic way global warming and uh, the issues that it poses to our nation and our way of life. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake of Arizona. Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Pence. Ms. Woolsey.
any of my Republican colleagues. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, next door neighbor. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Manzullo for his amendment. I support the amendment uh, in the nature of a substitute and a good faith effort to fight global pollution, which includes climate change, and to bring attention to the real threat posed by the lack of clean water. And I have recently, Mr. Chairman, been educated on the significance of clean water and that Rotary International has adopted that as their lead project to promote uh, throughout the world the development for uh, persons to have clean and potable water. Uh, this is really significant in that Rotary is the organization that sponsored Polio Plus, which was the most successful public health uh, inoculation program in the history of the world, uh, largely eliminating polio. Uh, Rotary with 30,000 members, 1.2 million uh, members in 170 countries is really going to make a difference, I believe, in regard to clean water issues. And in fact, if we uh, adopt the Manzullo Amendment, uh, I would urge that immediately there be uh, an effort to work with Rotary and other organizations. Rather than creating the Office of Global Climate Change that duplicates the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental Scientific Affairs, OES, this amendment simply consolidates the existing mm -hmm. offices within OES and appoints an ambassador at large to lead the effort. This new entity will remain in OES. It solves the problem of unnecessary duplication, but continues to fight global pollution and climate change without growing government. The amendment expands the underlying bill's proposed exchange program to cover all facets of global pollution. It houses this program within the State Department's Education and Cultural Affairs Bureau so that it can be better integrated and coordinated with the ambassador at large. And I urge my uh, colleagues to indeed look at all of the uh, provisions of the Manzullo Amendment, a very thoughtful and visionary amendment, and I urge its adoption. Thank you very much, Mr. Sherman of California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your efforts on global warming, and uh, thank you in advance for your indulgence to let me talk about a couple of bills dealt with earlier in this markup uh, when I could not be here. Uh, we passed a resolution praising Liechtenstein. I uh, would have hoped that we would have commented a little bit about Liechtenstein's unfortunately liberal views toward uh, tax evasion. And uh, we passed a resolution uh, praising Estonia, and I wish we would have commented upon Estonia's unfortunate decision to tear down a monument uh, to those who fought the Nazis uh, in Estonia during World War II. Um, and uh, with that, I yield back. Any of my Republican colleagues wish to be recognized? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Smith. Uh, just uh, Mr. Green was meeting with some Colombian senators, so couldn't answer a question I had earlier. If he wouldn't mind answering in Green 2 and 3, uh, where you talk about the promotion of use of American-made clean and efficient energy technologies uh, and, and your Third Amendment as well, uh, does that include uh, nuclear? As uh, I think my colleagues know, there, there are grave concerns about waste, uh, the issue of dirty bombs, the issue of uh, pollution, uh, if there is a meltdown, so that's not even the waste issue, as we saw in Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. And, uh, and, and it's not included in the definitions page, and we worked with the chairman on that. Uh, is that the intent, that, that this well, include nuclear? In response, uh, the definition page doesn't include nuclear, so I, I don't think this bill does. Although on a personal basis, I support nuclear energy. And uh, in fact, it's frustrating being in other countries and they're using our recycling uh, technology was actually developed in our own country that maybe we should be using to, uh, to lower whatever we would end up having to store ultimately. But, but the, that's but, not included but in the But the clear bill. intent of your amendment is yeah, the intent not of the to include is not to expand on what the chairman has in the listing, so it doesn't include nuclear. Thank you. Uh, since we seem to have a quorum, um, it is my intention to call for the votes on the measures we have dealt with so far. Uh, first, we shall vote on uh, Mr. Green's amendment. Mr. Manzullo's is pending. We will first vote on Mr. Manzullo's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The chair is in doubt. We shall have a roll call. Mr. Chairman, we yes. a point of order. The, uh, 
the, the, the amendment incorporates Mr. Green's amendments. Yes. Thank you. Yes, without objection. Chairman Lantos. No. Chairman Lantos votes no. Mr. Berman. Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Ackerman votes no. Mr. Falioma Vega. Mr. Falioma Vega votes no. Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne votes no. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman votes no. Mr. Wexler. Mr. Wexler votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Delahunt. Mr. Delahunt votes no. Mr. Meeks. Mr. Meeks votes no. Ms. Watson. Ms. Watson votes no. Mr. Smith of Washington. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Carnahan votes no. Mr. Tanner. Mr. Tanner votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. Woolsey. Ms. Woolsey votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Hinojosa. Mr. Crowley. Mr. Crowley votes no. Mr. Wu. Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller votes no. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott votes no. Mr. Costa. Mr. Costa votes no. Mr. Sirius. Mr. Sirius votes no. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Ms. Ross Leighton. Yes. Ms. Ross Leighton votes yes. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith of New Jersey votes no. Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton votes yes. Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Rohrabacher. Mr. Manzullo. Mr. Manzullo votes yes. Mr. Royce. Mr. Royce votes yes. Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Shabbat votes yes. Mr. Tancredo. Mr. Tancredo votes yes. Mr. Paul. Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake votes yes. Ms. Davis. Mr. Pence. Mr. Pence votes yes. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson votes yes. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman votes yes. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett votes yes. Mr. Mack. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry votes yes. Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall votes yes. Mr. Poe. Mr. Poe votes yes. Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis votes yes. Mr. Fortunio. Mr. Fortunio votes yes. Mr. Bilirakis. Mr. Bilirakis votes yes. And any member who has not yet voted, Mr. Berman? Mr. Berman votes no. Mr. Engel? Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith votes no. Any other member? Clerk will report. Mr. Rohrabacher. Mr. Chairman. Let's Mr. just Mr. wait until until. Mr. Chairman. Uh, may yes. I inquire how how I am recorded? Mr. Delahunt is is not recorded. Oh, is recorded as voting no. Mr. Wu. Mr. Wu votes no. Clerk will report. On this vote, there are 18 ayes and 27 noes. Uh, the amendment in nature of a substitute is not agreed to. Uh, before we had a quorum, uh, Mr. Green's amendments were informally accepted. 
to ensure regular order, I now call for a vote on Mr. Green's amendment. Clerk will call the roll. Chair Chairman Lantos. Uh, we can voice it. Uh, all in favor of the Green Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Green Amendment. Ms. Jackson Lee has an amendment. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, may I take uh, my two amendments in block? Yes. I ask unanimous consent. Without that objection. I Thank you. We dispense with the reading of the amendment and we recognize Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I first want to thank you for your extremely hard work and collaborative work on 2420 uh, and to make mention of the very unique aspect of this bill that creates uh, the uh, interesting feature of uh, what we call the Office of Global Climate headed by a new ambassador at large that will really be part of engaging uh, in the international effort uh, of addressing the question of global climate. My two amendments are very simple. One uh, simply allows for uh, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions are able to participate in the visits and exchanges between scientific researchers of the United States and other nations provided for in this bill. My amendment would also seek to include minority and women owned businesses in these exchange programs. The Second Amendment um, emphasizes negotiation and the indigenous uh, populations. While climate change affects all inhabitants of the earth, previous policy discussions have left out many groups. Negotiations that will affect our entire planet's future should not be limited to representatives of powerful governments and wealthy energy corporations. Minority and other disadvantaged groups often bear the brunt of environmental degradation, including the particular pollution and depletion of resources. So therefore, we are hoping that this amendment will ensure that the um, populations in the various countries, which include indigenous, tribal, and local groups in the dialogue of this very important issue of global climate change and global climate reform. With that, I ask my colleagues to support these two amendments, and I yield back my time. Chair supports the gentlelady's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is approved. <clears throat> uh, now. Uh, the question occurs on the motion to report H.R. 885 favorably as amended. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Well, Mr. Chairman, 885 is the nuclear fuel. It's the nuclear fuel um, legislation. All the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the motion to report favorably is adopted. Without objection, the bill be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating the, the amendments adopted by the committee, and the staff is directed to make any technical and conforming amendments. The question now occurs on the motion to report H.R. 2446 favorably. And Mr. Chairman, that's the Afghanistan bill. That's the Afghanistan you, bill. Chairman. I thank my colleague. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the motion to report favorably is adopted. Without objection, the staff is directed to make any technical and conforming amendments. The question now occurs on the motion to report uh, uh, the climate change bill favorably as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. The chair is in doubt. We will have a roll call. Chairman Lantos? Aye. Chairman Lantos votes yes. Mr. Berman? Aye. Mr. Berman votes yes. Mr. Ackerman? Mr. Ackerman votes yes. Mr. Faleomavega? Mr. Faleomavega votes yes. Mr. Payne? Mr. Payne votes yes. Mr. Sherman? Mr. Sherman votes yes. Mr. Wexler? Mr. Wexler votes yes. Mr. Engel? Mr. Engel votes yes. Mr. Delahunt? 
Mr. Delahunt votes yes. Mr. Meeks? Yes. Mr. Meeks votes yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Watson votes yes. Mr. Smith of Washington? Aye. Yes. Mr. Smith of Washington votes yes. Mr. Carnahan? Yes. Mr. Carnahan votes yes. Mr. Tanner? Yes. Mr. Tanner votes yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Green votes yes. Ms. Wolsey? Yes. Ms. Wolsey votes yes. Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson Lee votes yes. Mr. Hinojosa? Mr. Crowley? Mr. Crowley votes yes. Mr. Wu? Mr. Wu votes yes. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller votes yes. Ms. Sanchez? Ms. Sanchez votes yes. Mr. Scott? Mr. Scott votes yes. Mr. Costa? Mr. Costa votes yes. Mr. Sirius? Mr. Sirius votes yes. Ms. Giffords? Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes yes. Ms. Ross Leitonen? No. Ms. Ross Leitonen votes no. Mr. Smith of New Jersey? Yes. Mr. Smith of New Jersey votes yes. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gallagher? Mr. Rohrabacher? Mr. Manzullo? No. Mr. Manzullo votes no. Mr. Royce? Mr. Royce votes no. Mr. Shabbat? Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Tancredo? Mr. Tancredo votes no. Mr. Paul. Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake votes no. Ms. Davis. Mr. Pence. No. Mr. Pence votes no. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson votes no. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman votes no. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett votes no. Mr. Mack. Mr. Fortenberry. Yes. Mr. Fortenberry votes yes. Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall votes yes. No. Sorry. Mr. Poe. Mr. Poe votes no. Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis votes no. Mr. Fortunio. Mr. Fortunio votes yes. Mr. Bilirakis. Mr. Bilirakis votes no. Ms. Rohrabacher. Mr. Rohrabacher votes Ms. no. Ms. Giffords. Can you vote? You are not recorded. Ms. Ms. Giffords votes yes. Mr. Smith. Anybody who hasn't yet voted? Clerk will report. On this vote, there are 29 ayes and 16 noes. And the motion is agreed to. Uh, the chair is pleased to recognize the ranking member. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pursuant to rule, I hereby give notice of the minority's intention to file views for the report on this matter. Would you please clarify your policy as to when these will be due? Within five days. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating the amendments adopted by the committee. Staff is directed to make any technical and conforming amendments. I want to thank all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. This, uh, this uh, uh, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>